Hey, JJ, you there? Hey, hey. Hey, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm really excited to talk to you both. Well, thanks. since we have limited time, I'm just going to jump right into it. Sure. Um, so before getting into the specifics of the film, I love to hear how this project came to be. Uh, sure, I, I, I can start and JJ can pick up where I leave off, uh, I guess. Um, basically, I just was finishing up my last film and this was a story that I wanted to tell for a long time and uh, Creamy you know, obviously had a big impact on me and uh, I thought that the uh, the characters in the in the film, I, I'm sorry, the characters in the story that was Cream would make for a really interesting film, documentary film. And so uh, Jan Uwalski, who's the senior editor at uh, Cream, um, introduced me to JJ and JJ and I talked and had a really great discussion about it. And I think some other folks had approached him about it over the years as well. But, um, and then we just kind of settled on what we thought the, the, the art, the narrative of the film should be and, um, and really just kind of got the ball rolling. Did I leave anything out, JJ? I, I think you covered it. Um, Jan was, was definitely the common thread, uh, having been a senior editor at Kramer in one of the, the original Creamsters. Um, so I had known Jan forever and Scott had known her for quite some time because they had worked together on, on one of Scott's uh, magazines that he published, Heart. So she is the one who put us together. I had been approached um, a number of times over the years about doing a, a, a cream documentary. And for one reason or another, uh, there was never uh, alignment on what the story should be and how the, the director wanted to tell it. And, and Scott and I immediately connected and, and survived on what he, you know, his vision for, for the film. And I, you know, I remember very vividly that, that first conversation that I had with him coming out of that, feeling very, very excited and inspired about what we were setting out to do. And then you know, we were off and running. <laughs> so what were some of the challenges um, in stitching this story together and, and giving it the, um, the breadth and scope it deserved? Stitching is a, is, is a good word to use, stitching the story, because this was very much like a, a, a bootstrapped DIY project that we worked on. It started off as a, you know, a somewhat modest um, Kickstarter campaign, and we didn't even know if we were going to hit our goal. And then we successfully overfunded our, our, you know, our goal, and then things just started you know, slowly gaining momentum after that. Uh, but there were definitely fits and starts over the, you know, over a period of, you know, four years. This started back in 2016 and it usually doesn't take four plus years to put, you know, a documentary together. But because this was a very DIY bootstrap thing and because we had to stop at various moments to go out and raise more money and go out and wrangle more interviews, it took more time than usual. So those were, you know, there were definitely challenges and headwinds along the way, but it's kind of a testament to the team, to Scott, to Jan, to everybody involved that we really leaned into that um, and embraced the, the cream ethos and spirit of rolling up our sleeves and doing this on our own terms. It was definitely unorthodox um, in many ways, sort of guerrilla style interviews, you know, places that we weren't supposed to be interviewing people and things like that, that we were able to navigate. And that's, that's really a testament to, to Scott um, and, and his approach to really doing this and celebrating cream from a 360 degree, you know, approach. Yeah, it was, thank you. I, it was, uh, it's funny when you, when you watch the film and you hear about how cream was put together initially, um, you know, it was just, just this random bunch of strangers that came together and created this magic. Um, it was sort of paralleled the way we made this film. You know, they're very similar, um, uh, you know, approaches in a way. And, um, you know, I think we were all probably just as crazy as they were, but, um, <laughs> but I think we made, a, I'm really proud of the film, so. So it goes on set. Um, was there a unforgettable moment during the production of the film that you think really captures the spirit of Cream and the project as a whole? 
Mm. JJ? There were a, a, quite a few. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I guess one moment. Um, Scott, maybe I'll let you rehash the, the Mitch Ryder miking moment. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was <funny. laughs> That, that comes to mind, and, and maybe I'll, while you're telling that story, I'll think of another one. I'm still in therapy over that one. <laughs> um, this was just, uh, you know, just a great example of the kind of humor that maybe is very Detroit. I don't know. Um, maybe it's just because I'm East Coast and uptight. Um, but uh, I was, there was one point we were interviewing Mitch Ryder, and, um, uh, you know, um, who was an integral part of the Detroit music scene in the 60s and 70s and um and uh was uh also managed by barry kramer jj's father who also published cream of course anyway so uh, at one point we had to stop because there was some mic audio noise on his battery pack so i had to adjust it and you know as you know the battery pack usually fits behind you you know like on your waist and as i was adjusting it he farted on me and uh, <laughs> and i'm still having nightmares about that and he still maintained, he, he, he was deadpan about it. Deadpan. He's like, he, he kind of just he looked just up, said, gave you a nod. Said, yeah. Carry on. <laughs> Seems like that would happen in the cream office. It's like a beautiful <laughs> <Exactly>. day. <laughs> yeah. There was one other cool moment. It actually didn't make it into the film. It's when we were inter, uh, interviewing Cameron Crowe. And he was telling us some stories um, about making Almost Famous. And he told us this story about how he, when they were deciding who to cast as Lester Bangs, oh, he asked Tom Cruise to do a read through with him. And so Tom Cruise was reading the part that would eventually go to Philip Seymour Hoffman. Uh, and, and, you know, Lester, Lester uh, the character being read by Tom Cruise is talking about, you know, um, I, I forget what it was like, being uncool and you know not being good looking and all this stuff and, and it was just the irony that it was tom cruise oh, <laughs> you know reading in and, and, and according to cameron like nailing nailing the dialogue of course uh, but it was just a really cool story to sort of put yourself in that situation when cameron's trying to figure out what this character is going to look like on screen and having tom cruise yeah <laughs> Read, read for Lester. That was great. I forgot all about that story. I'm glad you remembered that, JJ. Yeah. That'd be a pretty amazing casting. I, I can't even imagine that now, but... Um, <laughs> Tom Cruise is Lester Banks. That should be your headline for this story. Yeah, <laughs> it should be. Um, you know, wh whether it was um, the style or editing, um, were there any other rock documentaries or documentarians that you um, were inspired by? And, and creatively put into the film? Um, <clears throat> I don't know about like uh, documentary filmmakers per se. I mean, I, um, I mean I'm mean, i a big Her Herzog fan, um, but you know, I don't pretend to be anything nearly as good as what anything he does. But um, I don't know, I've just seen a lot of, doc I'm a music doc geek, so I kind of just absorb them all and take what I think works and what doesn't. and try and you know make a make it mine somehow and um so i i know what what i think works visually and what doesn't and try to make it um all come together i i think we also you know had talked about early on you know the the, <clears throat> the national lampoon doc mm -hmm. um was you know somewhat of, of an inspiration just because we were coming at it from a similar angle trying to tell us, you know, a story about a, a static thing is a challenge. Right. And the way that, that they made the story about the cast of characters behind the magazine is also what we did stylistically. Stylistically, we did it differently, but it was the same concept um, of making this about more than just a thing. It's really about the people behind that thing. And I, I think that story can only be told <clears throat> with a magazine like National Lampoon or Cream or I'm sure Rolling Stone. Um, but there are other magazines that just wouldn't work because the characters just simply aren't that interesting. The magazine might be great, it's, but you know, the characters aren't there. So you know, n initially when you tell people you're making a documentary about a magazine, they just kind of go, well, how are, how are you gonna, you know, what's the story there? And so you've got to find the story and that's, you know, and it took us a while, but we kind of like, we 
we found it. And I think, um, and it was always about the characters. It was always about the, the staff. We just had to kind of like, sure, figure out who that core group was. And go well, with it. speaking of the staff, you know, they definitely had this unwavering commitment to being irreverent. Um, do you think we could use a little more of that nowadays? Oh, hell yeah. Um, I th <laughs> um, you know, I, I think, you know, in this, in this era, there's, there's almost, um, there's a hesitancy to be irreverent because there's such an impact and such a direct tie to click throughs and ad dollars. And there's this, you know, fear of pissing off an, an advertiser or a label in, in, in Cream's era, it was very much um, bite the hand that feeds, kill your idols sort of approach. And that's what made it so endearing to its readers, to the bands, uh, and, and to everyone else who, who touched the magazine. So I think because of, of where we are now, where the industry has gone with everything so tied to, you know, click throughs and things like that, um, not only has the, the writing suffered uh, and the media suffered, but the music has suffered because nobody's out there holding these folks accountable anymore for their shitty albums. So that's, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's why, you know, Cream was so important back in the day. I mean, you, you look at a site maybe like Pitchfork <clears throat> as sort of being, I mean, although somewhat pretentious, um, sort of like the last bastion of, of music criticism. And as someone who aspired to be a music critic, it is sort of been disappointing to see a lot of people pulling punches um, and not willing to take those creative risks. Do you see a future for music journalism? I mean, it's always going to exist, but what is your sort of overall op opinion on it and, and how can we move it in a better direction perhaps? Well, I think, go ahead, Scott. One way to start would be, to, as JJ said, is to stop thinking about, you know, click-throughs or, or in some cases your followers not following you or, you know, whatever response you might, because now it's all about, you know, responses and, and, um, and so I think it's, uh, you got to just tell the truth and whatever that might be. And also, you know, back to Pitchfork, I'm really, I've never been a fan. Um, and I know this is maybe not a popular opinion, but I really just can't stand rating systems. I can't stand putting music on a one to 10. I just don't think it's, yeah. about that. um, and that drives me crazy. So I'd like to just do away with that because I think that's like short attention span. And that's, you know, that's sort of like, that's just immediately like, okay, I'm not gonna, you're gonna make a, a snap decision whether or not you're gonna re continue to read this review or, or not based on whatever that score is, I think in a lot of times. And so I think bands are, it really does a disservice to the, to the music. So- I, um, you know. oh, go, Sorry, Scott, go ahead. No, that was it, the end of my preaching. I, I agree. And I think the, the more I've, I've thought about this, I really think that the future is, is essentially taking things back to the basics take a pressing reset on the whole thing. If we look back at what made Cream so popular, it was the sense of community between the artists, the writers, um, and the fans. And they each held each other accountable. And it was like this honest, passionate connection between them. Um, and so if you, do, if, if you were to just, you know, take everything right down, strip it down to the studs, that's what it is. It's, it's building this community that's based on first, foremost, and only the music and let, you know, let the rest of the chips fall where they may. Now, economically, that's easier said than done because, you know, you have to, you have to find other ways um, sure. to generate, you know, revenue for your, for your business. But the way we thought about, you know, if cream were to resurface someday is like, let's find other ways to drive revenue um, around the business, through merchandising, through other things to keep the journalistic component free and clear of any sort of obligation um, to anyone, you know, you know, no, no pages for payola type yeah. of uh, type of dynamic. That's very sure. common. It was when, when magazines, you know, were a thing and I'm sure it still is to this day and I'm sure the same applies with websites. And it's just frustrating. There's a, there's an expectation you know, I, I can remember getting letters from advertisers just saying, we just did a full page ad and you ripped apart our, and I didn't, I never saw the, I'm like, 
okay. I mean, I guess I sort of did, but I just, to me, it was always so separate. Church and state. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, it just, they didn't want to hear that. So um, I'm not going to get into names, but but I just think it's it's important that you, you maintain that integrity. And I think that's what JJ's talking about. And, and I'm, I'd love to see more of that. Um, I'm 100% on board with that. Um, as, um, as we're probably the most polarized We've, we've ever been in America um, debating what is right and wrong. Are there some lessons we can learn from the epic dogfights between David and Lester? Mm. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a lot we can learn. I mean, I think um, I can't imagine doing, I, when I was thinking about it and when we were making the film, I do remember actually getting in a fist fight with a friend over an album when I was about 17 in my bedroom because he said it was horrible and I thought it was amazing and we just couldn't agree so i can't which i feel silly i've never told that story before but it's true and um uh, and and it's just about the passion um and these were two incredibly passionate intelligent people that just were always going to butt heads and sometimes just for the hell of butting heads um i don't know it, it again it comes back to um how much does the music mean to you is it worth fighting for and and it should be if you're going to spend your life writing about it it better be <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'd love to say, you know, maybe in retrospect, they'd, they'd, you know, do something differently, but I doubt it. I doubt it. I think that, you know, part of, part of, you know, what, what made cream this lightning in a bottle moment was that creative friction that led to sometimes, you know, physical altercations, you know, all that passion pouring out. So um, I'm not sure what sort of learning moment <laughs> there, there is, uh, yeah. except that, you know, Sometimes when, when, you know, you have that right mixture of, uh, you know, genius and, and passion and, and crazy, you get cream. Um, so <laughs> that, that, that's what I learned. Yeah. Well, I guess that's pretty much all the time we have, but that was a great last comment. I want to thank you both for, for speaking with me. I probably can talk to you guys for three hours, but I think 15 minutes will do. So thank Thanks you so much. Thanks for taking the time, Nick. We appreciate yeah. it. All right. Good luck with the next journalist. <laughs> All right. Thanks, man. Take care. <laughs> Bye, guys. See ya.